Good morning. We will begin. Thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alex Pollock of the R Street Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our conference today on Puerto Rico's ongoing economic crisis. Uh, as you all know, Puerto Rico is the biggest municipal insolvency in history, far exceeding that of the former record holder, the city of Detroit, or the previous record bankruptcies of Jefferson County, Alabama, or Orange County, California. And now, uh, at the beginning of May, we have reached the hard part, which is sharing out the losses. The lawsuits are flying. We've got protests. The Government Development Bank, once considered the linchpin of Puerto Rico's finances, is slated for liquidation. And it looks like uh, we're headed for the court process defined by the PROMESA Act to decide what the various haircuts to creditors will be. Uh, as Desmond Lachman, my colleague who organized this conference, taught me, uh, Puerto Rico has three levels of crisis. Uh, one, it needs major reforms of fiscal and financial management and controls underway. Two, it needs reorganization of its massive debt, not to mention addressing its huge unfunded public pension obligations. And last, and by far the most difficult and subject to the greatest uncertainty, Puerto Rico needs to move over time from a failed dependency economy to a successful market economy if we can figure out how to do that. We have a distinguished and truly expert group assembled today to address the relevant issues. To begin, it's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Jose Carrion, who is the chairman of the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico, created by Congress in the PROMESA Act. A demanding job and a hot spot, uh, to be sure. No one is better placed to talk to us about the daunting financial and economic challenges of Puerto Rico. Jose has been president of the Puerto Rico Office of Aon Risk Services and president of Hub Carrion Lafitte and Casalos, where he is also a member of Hub International's Executive Management Committee. He's had leadership roles in numerous professional and community organizations, among others, the Young Presidents Association, the Automobile Accidents Compensation Authority, the State Insurance Fund, and the official Spanish Chamber of Congress. Jose, thanks very much for being with us today, and we're all looking forward to your remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Carrion. Uh, thank you very much. I. Um Honestly, never dreamed I'd be uh, here addressing, you know, uh, remarks before the AI. I just wish it were under um, different circumstances. So, but here we are. Um, good morning. My name is uh, Jose Carrion. I am the chairman of the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Desmond Lachland and the American Enterprise Institute for their kind invitation to be with you here today. I also would like to thank my uh, fellow oversight board member and uh, AEI resident scholar, uh, Andrew Biggs, for his leadership and support in facilitating this opportunity. Also, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank um, other members of the panel, very particularly Mr. Weiss, for all that he has done on behalf of Puerto Rico whilst he was serving at the uh, Treasury Department. The Financial uh, Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico is uh, made up of seven people from very different backgrounds, different political affiliations, uh, different professions, and different areas of expertise. Uh, we were chosen by the President upon the recommendation of congressional leaders uh, from different political parties in Washington who, as you very well know, are often at odds with each other. Uh, but the Board itself has been unified since its inception working to fulfill our duty and charge under the bipartisan uh, Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Stability Act, PROMESA, that created the board for the benefit of the people of Puerto Rico and various stakeholders. We have worked to understand the facts, the options available to the government, and the implications of different policy approaches to addressing the financial and, and the economic crisis facing our island. 
throughout, we have sought uh, to partner with the government of Puerto Rico and to use the tools made available to us under the law to help provide for a better future for the people of Puerto Rico, not just for today, but for our children and future generations. So where are we now? Uh, it would be fair for you to ask what kind of progress has uh, the board made since uh, its appointment on the 31st of August. Um, the answer, to be frank, is quite a bit, and there's much more to come. As with uh, any entity of new creation, we have had to spend uh, quite a bit of time getting ready to do our job. Thus far, we have had seven board uh, meetings, open meetings in accordance with the law, three in Puerto Rico and four in New York, open to the public and live streamed via the Oversight Board's website in both English and Spanish. In addition to the, these open meetings, the board as a whole has met both informally and in executive session regularly, both in person and by phone, and its committees and individual members have held countless, let me emphasize that, countless meetings with senior staff, advisors, officials, creditors, and many more stakeholders. We have adopted uh, bylaws, code of ethics, identified and engaged a number of Puerto Rico government entities or instrumentality subject to the financial oversight requirements of PROMESA, provided extensive guidance to the government of Puerto Rico as to the content required by statute for a government of Puerto Rico 10-year fiscal plan to be certified by the board and carefully assessed but ultimately decided not to certify the initial fiscal plan proposed by the prior governor of Puerto Rico last fall. One of the most difficult issues the board has had to tackle in advancing the PROMESA agenda including the all-important certification of a fiscal plan, has been determining as accurately as possible just what the government of Puerto Rico's revenues and expenses are. This has proven to be a far, far more challenging task than anyone has imagined. The government's most recent audited financial statements cover the period ending June 30th, 2014. If Puerto Rico's finances were straightforward, it might not be difficult to bring these numbers up to date, but the governor of Puerto Rico has well over 100 different entities, and there are 18 different issuers of debt. To assist in the process, we have hired advisors, including senior staff officers. We recently hired Executive Director uh, Natalie Jaresco. Uh, we have Deputy Director Ramon Ruiz Comas and General Counsel Jaime El Curry as well as strategic advisory firm, two economists, financial advisory, accounting, outside legal counsel, as well as Puerto Rico counsel, and lastly, and very important, ethics experts, consultants. In addition, as required by PROMESA, the board presented to the governor of Puerto Rico a slate of three candidates, uh, and the governor chose from those candidates an infrastructure and revitalization coordinator to comply with Title V of the statute. The Oversight Board and its advisors have worked closely with the government of Puerto Rico and its advisors, first with Governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla and since January with the new administration of Governor Ricardo Rosselló Nevarez. Although assessing Puerto Rico's revenues and expenses, setting the parameters for the Commonwealth's fiscal plan and those of the several covered territorial instrumentalities and in jumpstarting the infrastructure revitalization agenda have been some of our primary objectives we have also participated with Governor Rosillo's advisors in dozens of meetings with Puerto Rico's creditor groups, resuming conversations that have been commenced in the prior administration. On January 18th, we sent Governor Rosillo a letter outlining the baseline scenario for a fiscal plan, that is the difference between Puerto Rico's revenues and expenditures, assuming that Puerto Rico does not receive any new funding from Congress. Our findings confirm just how dire Puerto Rico's financial situation is. The average expected deficit is seven billion each year over the next 10 years. The letter outlined the kind of savings and structural reforms that would be needed to be made in, and the additional revenue that would have to be generated in order to obtain fiscal balance. At Governor Rosselló's request during our January 28th meeting, we extended the stay on creditor enforcement efforts from February 15th to the 1st of May and we authorized, as we were authorized to do under the law, and gave the new administration a short extension for our original deadline, certifying, uh, start setting a deadline for certification on March 15th. On February 28th, the, government, the governor and his advisors submitted their proposed fiscal plan, 
Upon careful evaluation, we notified the governor of certain deficiencies that would have to be corrected in order for the plan to comply with the 14 requirements set forth in PROMESA. On the 8th, the board released an independent analysis conducted by Ernst & Young to confirm the government's baseline projections for the fiscal plan and also the bridge between the last audited financial statements for fiscal year 14 and the fiscal 17 projections. Shortly thereafter, the governor submitted an amended fiscal plan, which the board did certify with several amendments on the 13th of March. Then this last Friday, after weeks of careful evaluation, analysis, and collaboration with the government of Puerto Rico officials, the board also certified with amendments the fiscal plans proposed by the administration for the GDB, the Government Development Bank of Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rico Highway and Transportation Authority, the Puerto Rico Water and Sewer Authority, or PRASA, and the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, or PREPA, the fiscal plan. Consistent with the objective specifically set forth in PROMESA, the central government's fiscal plan, certified by the Oversight Board, charts a path to achieve fiscal equilibrium in three years and provides adequate funding for essential services, maintains the solvency of government pension plans, restructures the government's long-term debts and obligations, and adopts the structural reform necessary to restore economic growth and opportunity in Puerto Rico. Achieving these objectives will not be easy, they, uh, and we understand that the plan is controversial. The cuts are deep, and in some instances will be painful. But we must realize that the problems facing Puerto Rico are massive. Over time, the government has made commitments to everyone, including employees, pensioners, college students, enrollees in healthcare programs, bondholders, and others that cannot be met based on realistic measures of the tax revenue the economy can currently support. However, we define the problem, whether in terms of budget deficits, indebtedness, unfunded pensions, or the imminent risk of simply running out of money to pay current bills, Puerto Rico faces a financial shortfall. The financial problems the government on the island did not develop overnight, and the solutions will not be implemented overnight. Puerto Rico's economy has declined severely since 2006. From fiscal years 2006 to 15, real GMP fell every year except one. The government's economic activity index, an indicator that has historically borne a 98% correlation with GNP, fell from 160 to 124 between August 2005 and August 2016. From 2003, Puerto Rico's population has declined over 9%, down to less than 3.5 million people in 2015. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 2015 Community Survey, 46.1% of Puerto Rico's residents live below the federal poverty level, compared with a national average of 14.7. And 36% of residents of Detroit, whose financial distress was viewed by many as uniquely devastating. Puerto Rico's is more so. For Puerto Rico children under age five, 63.7% live under the federal poverty level, compared with a national average of 22.8%. Median household income in Puerto Rico was $18,626 in 2015, compared with 56,515 in the United States, and to 27,000 in Detroit, $27,862 to be precise, in Detroit in 2011. In October 2016, Puerto Rico's unemployment rate was 12.1%, and only 987,606 persons were employed, down 23% from 1,277,559 employed persons in December of 2006. With approximately 74.5 billion of bond debt and 48 billion of unfunded pension liabilities, Puerto Rico's public debt as a percentage of income is quite staggering. As of 2012, Puerto Rico's public debt as a percentage of aggregate income was 100.7%, compared with 29% for New York, which has the highest ratio of public debt to income in the United States as a whole, whose average is 16.8%. Puerto Rico also faces significant immediate new cash needs as it approaches uh, unfathomable, unfathomable pension and Medicaid funding cliffs. As of June 30, 2015, the largest pension fund, ERS, owing $33.2 billion, was negative 1.8% funded. The highest funded public pension was 8.1% funded. 
And as a practical matter, virtually all public pension funding will be exhausted this summer for all pension plans, forcing the Puerto Rico government to pay public pensions or welfare out of general revenues. In fiscal year 2018, this will cost the people of Puerto Rico $989 million. To put Puerto Rico's $48 billion unfunded pension liability in perspective, the unfunded actuarial accrued liabilities in Detroit in 2013 were approximately $3.4 billion, and the public pensions were over 70% funded. Notwithstanding that the average pension benefit payment for government retirees in Puerto Rico is about $14,000, about half the benefit of government retirees in the U.S., the certified fiscal plan reduces pension payments to the extent combined pension and social security benefits exceed the poverty threshold of $1,000 per month. On the Medicaid front, the Affordable Care Act provided supplemental Medicaid funding for territories, of which Puerto Rico drew an average of $917 million per year from fiscal years 2012 through 2016. Puerto Rico drew $1.3 billion in fiscal year 2016. The balance of the supplemental funding will be spent by the end of calendar year 2017. There is no replacement funding thereafter, although recently uh, some funding for the remainder of the year was uh, put in the continuing resolution. We'll see how that plays out. As the, PROMESA created, as the PROMESA created Congressional Task Force on Economic Growth in Puerto Rico reported in 2016, the bipartisan Congressional Task Force, the government of Puerto Rico, which currently lacks the ability to borrow money in the capital markets to fill a large hole that will be left by the loss of federal funding, would presumably be compelled either to drop hundreds of thousands of current employees, current enrollees from the Medicaid program, ha harming quality of life and spurring out migration, or to relocate funds from other areas, such as payment to creditors and the provisions of public service. Given its magnitude, the cliff is certain to disrupt any existing stability in the provision of healthcare services in Puerto Rico for a large number of beneficiaries, end quote. The certified fiscal plans takes into account these fiscal cliffs, as well as Puerto Rico's repeated understatement of its expenses in its annual budgets. As I already mentioned, the Oversight Board retained Ernst & Young to bridge the last audited financials to the present. In its report, Ernst & Young determined that the government's fiscal year 2017 expenditures could be understated by, the, by a range of $360 million to $810 million. The fiscal plan uses $585 million, the midpoint in this range, and adopts a variety of stringent measures to fill the gaps created by the fiscal cliffs and understatement of expenses. In any fiscal crisis, there is a temptation to believe that one can emerge without undue sacrifice if only others would bear the costs, or if the elusive economic turnaround finally happened. The fact is that any real solution must involve all parties sharing in the effort, especially if it's painful. But all should also share in the opportunity for a better, more secure, and prosperous future. It is always tempting to avoid difficult choices by assuming that the economy will grow faster, that tax revenues will increase, or that government spending will come under budget. But in the past, this thinking has almost always seemed to serve to make problems worse by putting off solutions. Our many meetings with individuals and groups from throughout the island showed that Puerto, Rico's, Puerto Ricans understand the problems that have held the economy back. For too long, the government has spent more than it collects and has been unwilling to tax adequately to fund the services it provides. Regulations have protected some jobs and some businesses, but reduced the growth of new jobs and the creation of new businesses. Welfare and labor laws have protected those in need, but penalized those who choose to work. Incremental reforms may be tempting, but the residents of Puerto Rico and the investors who can build jobs on the island could not be blamed for giving up hope if we fail to seize a singular rare opportunity for far-reaching reforms. Putting off change means a future of liquidity crises, of government checks that one cannot cash, or more debt to be borne by Puerto Rico's children and grandchildren. Throughout the, board, throughout the process, the board has been strongly committed to a once-and-done approach to Puerto Rico's financial crisis. This means establishing a set policy changes that, at least in expectation, should put the budget and the economy back on track. We believe such an approach is necessary for Puerto Rico to effectively use the tools PROMESA has provided to genuinely solve Puerto Rico's longstanding crisis and to put the island on the path to a better future. Once and done does not mean that future reforms will not be necessary, nor that we cannot redirect the path we have charted 
but PROMESA offers a rare opportunity for the government to restructure its debts in an orderly way, free from the chaos of legal suits. It is human nature to procrastinate, to put off for tomorrow, decisions that are difficult to make today, but if we delay much needed reforms into the future, we will face these problems without full access to the tools that the law has provided. That is why, in addition to the savings measures already implemented by the current administration, the fiscal plan certified by the Oversight Board imposes additional cost-cutting initiatives that understand, understandably are not very popular. The plan calls for a 100% reduction in subsidies to municipality approximately, amounting to approximately 375 million per year, incremental reductions in subsidies to higher education, or approximately $475 million, a 35% reduction in personnel and operating expenses, amounting approximately to $1.6 billion per year, and reductions in firm-specific subsidies in various sectors of $100 million per year, a 30% reduction in healthcare costs, amounting to approximately $100 million per year, an average 10% reduction in pension expenses implemented in a progressive manner amounting to approximately $250 million per year. Cancellation of Christmas bonuses for public employees if certain liquidity targets are not satisfied. Four day per month furloughs for most central government employees if certain liquidity targets are not satisfied. Um, after five years, the fiscal plan saves about $3.6 billion per year off the structural budget starting with more than 1.1 billion savings in its first year. The 3.6 billion savings represents a 28% reduction of projected structural spending levels in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico's 12.85 billion of non-federal expenses in fiscal year 2022. As you may imagine, in attempting solutions to such uh, complex problems as Puerto Rico's fiscal and economic crisis, it is impossible to please everybody. Rather, if you do your job right, you are certainly to enrage everybody. And so the fiscal plan certified by the Oversight Board has drawn criticism from, among others, creditors who contend that it should mandate even deeper cuts and a lot more money for debt service. One undisputed principle guiding Puerto Rico's debt restructuring is that the government and the Oversight Board cannot accomplish PROMESA's twin mandate for Puerto Rico to achieve fiscal responsibility and to restore access to the capital markets if we do not end Puerto Rico's negative economic growth and grow substantially. The fact is that further cost cutting and revenue raising would produce small cash benefits for 10 years, but economic detriment for the next 32. Virtually all the measures available for balancing the budget in the short term worsen economic growth, without which adequate debt service payments are impossible. As the certified fiscal plan provides, the saving measures negatively impact growth through fiscal year 21, and real economic growth does not return positive until fiscal year 24, when the positive impact of the authority's structural reform agenda begins to take hold. The Oversight Board retained economists and consultants to gauge the impact of Puerto Rico's real growth outlook of the measures prescribed by the Board to attain fiscal responsibility. The savings measures I just summarized are so large that our advisors warn that one, additional short-term cuts might produce slightly higher resources over the first 10 years, but never do over the longer 2018-60 period. Number two, the amount of additional cutting is limited as the policies needed to generate annually further material resources is not consistent with sustainable growth and primary balance path. And number three, with all the other downside risk, we cannot push the baseline path to the minimum of the viable range. Subject to the objectives of achieving fiscal balance and market access, which can only be achieved by ensuring economic growth in Puerto Rico, the Oversight Board has sought to maximize returns to creditors. The nub of the issue is the size of the economic pie available to be divided. The creditors insist that the pie is larger than the Board's economists and consultants believe it to be. The Oversight Board shares the creditors' desires to enlarge the funds available for debt service, but cannot adopt lofty assumptions for available funds without violating PROMESA provisions that require outcomes consistent with the certified fiscal plan's debt sustainability analysis. The fiscal plan and the oversight boards, the fiscal plan the oversight board certified starts by increasing revenues and cutting virtually all expense areas, including education, health care, pension, employment, and even legislative expenses. Trying to impose additional cuts would create the opposite effect that, that creditors seek. It would render Puerto Rico's viability impossible because further short-run savings would lead to an unstoppable downward fiscal spiral in the long run. 
In short, a certified fiscal plan has been the foundation upon which the government of Puerto Rico, with the board's assistance and support, has engaged the various creditor groups in negotiations and mediation efforts in the last few weeks with the objective of reaching consensual restructurings. PROMESA was enacted to build a path to fiscal stability, economic growth, equitable restructuring of the government debt, and restored access to capital markets. Make no mistake, without the bipartisan legislation, the island would be facing a financial and legal chaos right now. Without hope of reversing the economic decline and the sad exodus of more Puerto Ricans seeking to build a prosperous life on the mainland with their families. Without truly massive changes, though, and without using the tools provided under the law, Puerto Rico would face continued decline and deprivation. The people of Puerto Rico deserve better than that, and the board has pledged its efforts to work toward a better future for everyone on the island. We are fully aware of how much work remains to be done. But the certification of a detailed fiscal plan on the 13th was a major milestone, one that we, that we trust will provide the foundation for real economic growth and over time restore opportunity to, to our people. One thing that every economist and consultant has agreed on is that PROMESA's objectives for Puerto Rico cannot be attained without returning to positive economic growth. Even as we pursue and accomplish the required objectives, I, yeah, I would love to, yeah. yeah. Even as we pursue and accomplish the required objectives of fiscal equilibrium, balanced budgets, and debt restructuring, Puerto Rico will hardly come out of its economic and fiscal crisis unless it also manages to restore economic growth. To that end, the Oversight Board will continue to seek opportunities to collaborate with the government of Puerto Rico in the design and implementation of structural reforms that go even beyond the important structural reforms already implemented by the current administration in the areas of labor regulation, permitting and energy reforms, commercialization, privatization, and public-private partnerships, among others that would promote economic growth and restore opportunity on all on the island. In closing, we are all in this together, and we must work together to do what is needed for a better future for our people. Without a return to growth, prosperity, and opportunity, there will be no money for health care, for pensions, for debt, and for other stakeholders. The board is hopeful for the future of Puerto Rico, the island spirits, and its resources, if properly applied, for tell a much better life for our children and our grandchildren. But one cannot spend hope. We cannot expend resources today in the hopes that tomorrow's economy will pay for them. Rather, we must build tomorrow's economy by making now the difficult choices that we have long known are necessary and start building a better Puerto Rico for this future and its future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you take a couple questions? I, th I think we have, have time at this point for uh, two uh, questions, and then we're going to move to our panel. We'll have uh, questions uh, later on. Sorry, I can't take you all right now. We'll start with the gentleman here. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much. I'm sorry, I should have asked you to identify yourself. Yes, Juan uh, Hernandez. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for being here and sharing your thoughts. I was wondering if you could share with the group your initial thoughts on the new fiscal year budget submitted by the governor. Uh, to the control board. Sure. First, it's good to see you, Senator. Um, Likewise. My, uh, <laughs> my, I will be very brief in answering that question since the budget was submitted on the 30th and uh, I haven't had an opportunity to review it. In fact, none of us have. We've been very busy with other issues. <laughs> I'm going to take one. Uh, one, one more question. I think we'll go way to the back here, this gentleman here. Yeah, good, good morning. Sorry, I can't take Mr. everybody. Carrion, Jose Delgado from El Nuevo Día newspaper. Can, can you tell us if you are going today uh, to announce uh, the use of Title III of PROMESA? So um, the answer to that question is that um, we have been advised by uh, our attorneys not to comment any longer <laughs> on any restructuring <laughs> Uh, questions and uh, I can say that uh, that uh, that issue will shortly be answered. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask the panel to come up to the dais, please. Uh, that we'll thank you very much, oh, thank Jose. You. No, it's my We're going to have the panel. There'll be a general Q and A at the end of that for for those of you. Can we uh, join me up here, please? Thank you. Let's
sit on. Can be careful. That should be you, Al. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion with an outstanding panel. Let me introduce the members of the panel in the order uh, in which they will speak. Uh, first will be Andrew Biggs, uh, who is a member of the Oversight Board, an expert in state and local government pensions, social security, and public sector pay and benefits. Andrew is a resident fellow at AEI. Previously, he was the principal deputy commissioner of the Social Security Administration uh, and on the White House National Economic Council. Andrew served on a blue ribbon panel to study the underfunding of public sector pension plans uh, and now has the opportunity uh, to work <coughs> on Puerto Rico's uh, 40 some billion unfunded of public pension obligations. Uh, next will be Ann Krieger, Senior Research Professor of the International Economics at the School for Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, Senior Fellow at the Stanford Center for International Development, and Senior Fellow of the Hoover Institution. She was previously first Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, a past president of the American Economic Association, and has published extensively on international finance and economic policy, and among many other subjects, has closely studied the fiscal and economic problems of Puerto Rico. Our third panelist will be Antonio Weiss, who is a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Musavar Romani Center for Business and Government. Antonio served as counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury Department, effectively as Undersecretary for Domestic Finance, where among many other responsibilities, he headed the Treasury's work on the debt crisis uh, in Puerto Rico uh, and worked closely with Congress to allow the possibility of an orderly restructuring of the Puerto Rican government's debt, which, uh, as the gentleman uh, in the rear asked about, uh, may, may be soon forthcoming and, and is now, of course, uh, uh, subject to a lot of contentious process. Prior to the Treasury, Antonio served in leadership roles at Lazard in New York and Europe, including as, head of, uh, including as global head of investment banking, and he was also the publisher of a leading literary quarterly, the Paris Review. Uh, our uh, last speaker, Desmond Lockman, has been a resident fellow at AEI since 2003, focusing on the global macroeconomy. Desmond writes extensively on international economics, including financial crises, of which we uh, never seem to run out of, uh, currencies, ongoing strains in the euro area, and the continuing debt and economic crises of Greece and Puerto Rico, and the very instructive parallels of these, of these two uh, problem uh, areas. Previously, he was managing director and chief emerging market economic strategist at Solomon Smith Barney and a deputy director at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, when we discussed having this panel uh, in May, Desmond and I figured the timing would make it very interesting, as it has. Uh, each panel, each uh, of our panelists will speak from 12 to 15 minutes, after which we'll give them a chance to react to each other or clarify points, and after that we'll <coughs> open the floor to your questions, and we will adjourn promptly at noon. Andrew, you have the floor. Well, thanks very much, Alex. Uh, thanks. It, it's very nice to be uh, with you all here today, and it's obviously an honor for me to, to serve on, on the board. I thank Antonio for having uh, the faith in me when he was at Treasury Department to, to facilitate that. Um, my background is in retirement issues. I work a lot on state and local pensions, and obviously anybody who works in that area knew that Puerto Rico's pensions were uh, really the worst funded in the United States, the public employee pensions. So the, the game plan I had going in was go in, fix the pensions, cover myself in glory, <laughs> and then perhaps retire to Puerto Rico. And you know, it's, it, 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 there was a certain logic to that, though. That you say, if you look around at all the US states, the, the public employee pensions are really the worst problem financially that, that's facing them. And Puerto Rico is the worst fund in the, in the country, so you figure, okay, if you fix those, then we're pretty much good to go. And the reality, of course, turned out to be, be, to be different. On, on the one hand, I think the, the, <coughs> the, the, the fiscal plan that we certified has what I would call the most far-reaching uh, public pension reforms that ever been passed in the U.S. 
so that you know, over time you're going to have a pension system that is truly sustainable, that if you go out 10 or 20 or 30 years when uh, states like Illinois and California and New Jersey are going to be eaten alive by their pension plans, uh, Puerto Rico will be in a much, uh, much better case, a much better state then. I think that is something that, that points towards a long-term viability economically and financially of the island. Um, at the same time, though, all the other problems in Puerto Rico are so large um, and, and pervasive that we ended up engaging on, on so many other fronts than just the, the, the pensions that I originally thought about. I mean, the pensions were a prominent problem, but they were really just, in, in, a, in a way, uh, the tip of the iceberg. And so this led to um, you know, a, a fiscal plan that really touches on all parts of the government and, and all parts of the, of the economy in Puerto Rico. And I think this leads to a kind of a, an interesting sort of tale of two cities narrative. And th those two cities are Washington, D.C. and San Juan. In Washington, D.C., if you follow the political press here, there's sort of a narrative of, well, the, the board is kind of a do-nothing rubber stamp for the government, classifies all government spending as essential, doing nothing but you know, facilitating the government, sticking it to the creditors and all that. And you know, you could, if you look in you know, sort of opinion articles here in, in D.C., you can, you can see that. And, but if we transfer to the other city, I say, okay, if all of that were true, why would I not feel 100% safe showing my face in the streets of San Juan? <laughs> The Puerto Ricans have been very welcoming and extremely friendly people, but if you follow the press narrative in Puerto Rico, it is a completely different story. Where it's, I think most people there understand there are very difficult choices that need to be made, but there is a sizable and very agitated component there which feels very strongly, you know, as, as they put it, that we're the debt collectors for the hedge funds, that we, you know, we're stripping the, the government to the bone crippling the island for the future just to pay off the, the creditors. So, it, you know, this is a typical sort of uh, kind of restructuring situation where everybody thinks they're being treated badly and if only the other people were treated a little bit more badly, um, that, that things come out ahead. You know, I think the, the reality is, you know, both of these stories can't be right. Um, but the reality is, that in, in a sense, both of the, those narratives are, are sort of wrong in the sense that you know, the, the board has, has pushed, for, I think, you know, for much greater fiscal responsibility and restructuring in, in the Puerto Rican budget and the Puerto Rican government than you otherwise would have seen. Um, you know, it's, uh, the, ori the original fiscal plan that we received from, from the former governor in the fall, that didn't contain, in our view, enough uh, reductions in spending, enough uh, restructuring, and we rejected that plan. We received a second plan from, from the new governor after he came into office <laughs> in the new year, and we also rejected that plan. I think I don't have the precise numbers in, in my head, but the fiscal plan we were finally able to certify uh, last month, I think that probably contains about twice as much spending cuts as were proposed in the original fiscal plans we received. So I think the, the idea that, um, that you see in Washington, D.C., that the board is just a, you know, a sop to the government and all we care about is you know, shifting costs on the creditors, I really think that's, that's not true. Um, you know, just to start with pensions, which is the area in which I know, um, you know Jose Carrion touched on this. But the fiscal plan um, looks at total cuts in pension benefit outlays of around 10%. Um, and this is against a baseline, as Jose pointed out, in which pension benefits are not incredibly high by, um, by mainland standards. Uh, we, we've tried to, re to structure these reductions in such a way as to, to spare the people at, at the bottom who are, who are receiving the lowest benefits. But you know, I think there are going to be cuts in benefits for people whose monthly benefits are as much as some people in Washington, D.C. spend on a pair of shoes. So um, it's, you know, it, it, it's to be taken in context that these, these are serious changes that are being made. Moreover, the changes going forward to the pensions, all employees, current employees and future hires are going to be shifted to a defined contribution 401k style pension plan that is going to be self-funded, that cannot create unfunded liabilities going into the future. This is far beyond, I mean, a few states have said, well, newly hired employees will go into a defined contribution plan. Um, and so over the long term, the very long term, that's going to help them. This is a much more dramatic change. And it is a change that I think really bodes well for the, for the budgetary and fiscal viability of the island going forward. 
that this, the, you know, this component of the budget, which has been crippling them, uh, you know, in, in the near term, the, the government has to pay increased costs. It, what it had been doing was taking the mandatory contributions from employees, which was telling, it was telling the employees it was sort of going to an account for them. But in reality, they were taking that money and using it to pay current retirees. And that's, it's just not, that sort of thing is not sustainable when you look at how the demographics are changing in the island. And we said, you can't do that anymore. So the employees' contributions, instead of being spent on other things, are going to their own defined contribution accounts so it'll be saved for their retirement. That means the government in the short term has to make up the difference. And so that reduces the net near-term savings from pension reform, but it also means that over the long term, you have a much, much more sustainable uh, pension plan. So I think you know, just by itself, that's a pretty major reform. Uh, but you know, it, it, as Jose um, outlined, there's also a number of other reforms that, that are going to be implemented and that the board was involved in, in pushing. Um, the numbers, you know, by 2022, when we're looking at a full implementation, you're looking at a nearly 30% cut in government health spending. Um, cuts in reimbursement rates, uh, coverage reductions, increased cost sharing, you know, pretty much anything you can do to reduce health care costs is, has been looked at there. And that's, uh, that, that health care spending is something like 20% of Puerto Rican GDP, so that is a not insubstantial cut. Um, both in, in government outlays, but also in the incomes that providers are going to receive. So that th this has not just a budgetary impact, it has a sort of macroeconomic impact that we need to think about in terms of what is the, the economy going to be like going into the future and what's its capacity to sustain debt payments. Uh, um, on top of that, we're looking at uh, big cuts in the subsidies that the central government in Puerto Rico pays to municipalities, to local governments. Um, a lot of the local governments receive up to half of their revenues from these subsidies from the federal government, those are going to be scaled down very, very significantly. Similarly, you get a large cut in government subsidies uh, for economic development, for tourism, <coughs> for agriculture, for the rum industry, things like that. There's going to be a school consolidation, uh, consolidation of government agencies, uh, potentially furloughs of government employees. So this is something, it, it, I, again, I push back a little bit on this do-nothing narrative you get in Washington, D.C. This is as if the federal government said, okay, we're going to fix Social Security and Medicare and then the education system, we're all going to do it in the, in the space of about six months. You know, this is, you know, this, these are very ambitious reforms that are very politically difficult to do. And you know, I'll, I'll give credit to my you know, fellow board members, but also to the, you know, to the, to the governor um, in, in Puerto Rico for saying, you know, we have to do this, we're going to take on this problem. But I do think you know, it's, if, if, the, if reforms are really to succeed, if, we're, if Puerto Rico is going to get to be where it wants to be, it has to go just you know, beyond merely sort of the, the, the budget balancing exercise that, that we've gone through. And it has to make, I think, a compelling case to people of why you want to live in Puerto Rico, why you want to start a business there, why you want to work there. Um, and, and that involves not just the sort of budgetary exercise we've been going through, it, it involves making this you know, a, really a better place to do business. Um, wh when I think about the core problem facing the island, the way I would look at it is just simply low labor force participation rates, low, low employment rates. I think the labor force participation rate in Puerto Rico is somewhere around 40%. A little bit of that is demographically driven because it's, it's an older population, but even if you restrict to working age people, that is substantially, substantially lower than even the worst U.S. state. Uh, we ran some numbers, and if Puerto Rico increases labor force participation rate to even that of the lowest mainland state, the, the economy, I think GNP would be something like 10% bigger, the, the tax revenues be increased substantially. A lot of the problems that we face here would go away. And so I think it's worth looking at, at why you have that problem. And it's not, obviously you have a, you know, an enormous economic problem going on right now, but the, these, were, these were issues that preceded all of that. Um, they, they developed over time. It is not that Puerto Rico always had low labor force participation rates, but beginning in the 70s, uh, things changed, policies changed, changed, and you've developed a, a problem where there just aren't enough people working. One of the issues um, is, uh, is a lot of requirements that are legal requirements that are put on to employers in terms of providing paid vacation, paid sick leave. 
Um, there's no employment at will, which is, I think there's one U.S. state that doesn't have employment at will. That means if you want to let an employee go, it has to be for cause, which means you have then have a, a potential legal case. It is just, it is, you, you have a setup that, that, that says to employers, it makes it difficult or costly for them to hire. To the government's credit, it has, it has passed reforms to some of those laws to weaken them. I would think, though, that if you were to compare the, the sort of the, the employment burden in Puerto Rico to any of the U.S. states, those reforms would take Puerto Rico from being by far the worst to may still the worst. You know, you don't, it, we have to be more ambitious than that. Um, similarly, uh, on the welfare side, there's been analyses done that, that look at the, the implicit taxes on individuals who are receiving welfare benefits who choose to work. Um, you have people who are receiving food stamps benefits, housing benefits, uh, TANF, which is your cash welfare benefits. In a lot of cases, if you are a low-income individual and you're receiving those benefits, you choose to work, your benefits are, are basically reduced dollar for dollar for the amount of earnings you get. So you have essentially a 100% implicit tax rate. You have, the, you have an irony that Puerto Rico works with a, a minimum, they work with the, the federal mainland minimum wage, which is very high um, by, by island standards. But for a low income person who chooses to work, who's receiving welfare benefits and chooses to work, the, the wage they receive effectively in often cases is zero because the amount they lose in welfare benefits is equivalent to what they're earning. So you have a situation where you're penalizing employers for hiring, you're reducing incentives to work. This is textbook stuff. If you do those things, you are going to get low employment, and that's exactly what you have. One thing I think is worth looking at is, is, is setting ambitious goals. You know, we're going through a fiscal restructuring, a fiscal consolidation here, which may be necessary, but inevitably you know, reduces uh, economic activity, reduces the, the amount of money in the, in the economy, and that, that hurts you down the road. I, my view is you want to go as much as you can for ambitious reforms that signal to people that the island is, um, is serious about moving forward. We don't have a lot of money to throw around, but instead of that, what you can try to do is generate confidence. Confidence that this is going to be a great place to, to live, a great place to work, a great place to, to start a business. One of the things that I think is worth looking at is, I mean, the, the World Bank does uh, a ranking of you know, ease of doing business in different countries. They look at things like um, you know, tax <coughs> compliance, you know, how, many, how much permits you need to start a business, a whole range, a whole range of different things. Um, the U.S. overall is ranked eighth in the world for the ease of doing business. So we're not the best, but we're, we're up there. Puerto Rico is ranked 55th. So you know, if you're ranked, as they are, between Peru and Rwanda in terms of ease of doing business, you just, you're not going to get that, that many jobs there. It, 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 and what I think, what I would like to see would be for the, for the government to say on these measures, these are things that, that are measured by other people. They're not, they're not numbers we can fudge. We aim to move up 10 slots in the ease of, business, of doing business ranking over the next couple of years. They're very specific things they can look at and they can use that as a way of, of moving ahead. One minute, Andrew. One minute. So a uh, good thing, I'm right at the end. <laughs> so it's, my, my point here is that um, you know, there are very difficult decisions the board has had to make in terms of fiscal consolidation. Um, and and those, they, they have to be done, but inevitably they impose pain on people today and, and they're gonna make it harder to grow in the future. What we need alongside those are, are things that the, the, the government needs to look at of how do we make structural reforms that build a stronger economy, a stronger workforce for the future that can bring people back uh, who have moved to the United States and bring businesses back and I think make for a, a really a, a much stronger future for the island as a whole. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I congratulate uh, Senor Carrion, and I congratulate those of the others on the board because they do have a very tough job. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, I'm going to be.
skipping around a bit more than I planned to because some things have already been said. And the first thing I will say is that I agree with almost everything that's been said so far, except maybe I would go a little bit further in some dimensions and there's some things that perhaps uh, can get a little more attention than you've done so far. But let me start, surprisingly enough, with a little bit of history because it's important. Uh, Puerto Rico ought to be the jewel of the Caribbean. Puerto Rico is a beautiful island. It has American law, US dollar, a lot of other advantages, beaches and so on and so forth. It should be an attractive spot uh, for companies to have their headquarters if, from Europe if they do business in both North and South America and Middle, Central America, of course, too. It should be. It is not. It is by no means. Uh, one of the numbers I picked up uh, in, in trying to do this is that the Dominican Republic tripled its tourist beds between 1970, I think, or 1980 and now, and Puerto Rico is up 10% at most. And perhaps even that isn't right because the occupancy rate is so very low, about 50%, whereas DR is closer to 100. All of these things, I could go on and on with those statistics. Uh, Andrew mentioned the uh, employment situation. Well, uh, I'll come back to some parts of that, but let me just mention that there's an informal sector about which we know very little, which is my best guess, and it's only a guess, is probably somewhere around 25% of production that happens in Puerto Rico takes place, I would guess, in the informal sector. It's big, and it's big because it's avoiding a lot of what you talked about. It is not something that's just happened uh, that way. But the hit, back to history for a moment. Uh, the current mess comes about because of low growth, but low growth comes about in large part because of a number of policies that have been adopted. And the first thing that seems to me we need to talk about, or just to remember, is that uh, the United States has shot Puerto Rico in one foot, so the Puerto Ricans shot themselves in the other. Uh, everybody has contributed to this, both in what they did and because of the confused expectations as to whom will do what. Uh, I think the Puerto Ricans perhaps are relying a little too much on something from the mainland, and meanwhile the mainland is relying perhaps a little too much on the Puerto Ricans, but each is in a way delaying doing perhaps part of what they should because they think or hope that the other will to some extent ease what has to be done, and I certainly agree with what has to be done. Uh, finally, of course, it got to a point where they, after 1996, every, I think every year but one or two, the governor promised a balanced budget, and I think in most one year they actually achieved it. In 1996, they got almost no growth. Everybody talks about a decline starting in 2003, which is correct, but growth really stopped so almost 10 years before that, and population has been going down, uh, and so on and so forth. Finally, to their point where they're on the dollar, they don't have an independent and can't have an independent monetary policy, uh, they can't do anything else independently, and they can't borrow anymore. There was no choice but to do something. They can't devalue the currency. Uh, and meanwhile, they were unable to borrow in the market, so they could spend no more than they received in income from the U.S. government and their own tax resources. And thereupon came, of course, the control board to try and support the reforms that are not a choice. They're absolutely essential, or the, choice, the only choice is to let uh, the island continue to have a diminishing real GDP and a diminishing population. There are estimated to be about 7.5 million people in this world who were born in Puerto Rico, of whom at the moment less than half are there, 3.5 at most and probably below that after last year. So the population is declining, lots of other things are going wrong, and it's going to take a sharp break with the past, including in my judgment, most importantly convincing people uh, that what is changing will be stuck to, that they will adhere to it. Uh, you mentioned the uh, pension system. They switched to defined contributions some years ago, but then they spent all the defined contributions on benefits of those who were in the old system because they didn't have any other money. So again, we have def we've, we're not changing to define, <laughs> we're just changing the financing so a benefit means financing by a benefit. It's not the original thing. And so mo many things have happened like this. They, it is not that they haven't tried, it isn't they haven't cut, but the severity of the problem has not been <coughs> recognized. And for at least 10 years, if not longer, Puerto Rican authorities thought they were in recession. They said Keynesian spending was the solution. They tried it, they built up the debt, <clears throat> and it certainly did not work. I'd continue, but I know Alex is going to tap his butter glass at me before too long. Uh, so, so all that said, of course, until the New Deal, 1930s, <coughs> Puerto Rico was pretty much neglected by Washington, almost completely. Starting with the New Deal, and especially with FDR appointing Rex Tugwell, who was part of his kitchen cabinet, to oversee it. And Tugwell was a really convinced socialist, at least, uh, to oversee Puerto Rico. And 
Tugwell wanted to make it his experiment in socialism. Set up, I've seen different estimates from 150 to 250 state uh, public <laughs> enterprises in Puerto Rico. Uh, did other things and find all kinds of associations and stuff. And the poor economic policy started <coughs> there, and I think that's important to remember. It was not Puerto Rican homegrown, it was mainland grown as it started. Uh, it is not entirely their fault. The reason there are so many bond issues, there are so many issuing agencies, and the reason there are so many agencies is because that's what was set up under Tugwell and carried on. Basically, after he left, though, one governor sort of followed him, and after that, things were more or less left as they were till the late 1970s, when the then administration, in its wisdom, noted that Puerto Rico wasn't growing, once again, and decided the thing to do would be to give U.S. corporations that, got, uh, that shifted their manufacturing operations there tax exemptions. Well, now, if you do that, who's going to move? Unskilled labor using manufacturing or capital intensive manufacturing? Capital intensive manufacturing, right? So what move in? Pharmas. Pharmas do not hire and train unskilled workers. That isn't their job, that's not what they're paid for. So there was a boom in Puerto Rico, but it was these incoming firms. The Puerto Rican authorities, by, either before that, but certainly at about that time, also began negotiating firm by firm with others and even with the pharmas <clears throat> when they were to come in. So different companies got different tax breaks, promised for so many years in the future, just depending on what was negotiated. And the record as to who got what is incomplete. Uh, and at least the director of the agency that granted those favors is, that I met, which was very two years ago, I guess, uh, basically said, we do not do cost benefit ahead of time. We don't follow up to see if they will do what they say they'll do. So these companies get their benefits and that's it. And the ta effective tax rate they pay in Puerto Rico is further below uh, the, the, the le legislative rate than it is in the United States mainland, where corporate taxes, are we, as we know, are full of loopholes, too. So in effect, many of these things came about as discretionary, it's ad hoc, it's one firm at a time. And once you've signed such an agreement with a firm, there's no way the authorities, when they need more revenue, can raise the tax rate there at all. At least not until the agreements run out, and since they're staggered, and since the firms always threaten to leave, and since there are about, I've forgotten, 10 of them, that perhaps provide half the revenue. Uh, it, it's a big problem for the Puerto Ricans, which they've, of course, created by having these promises to individual firms, but it nonetheless has to be corrected. I could go on. One of the problems Puerto Rico has, I think, for our understanding, and I think this is true for everybody, is that Puerto Rican median family income is about $17,000. <coughs> Mississippi is the poorest mainland state, and Mississippi's per capita, median per capita income is on the order of 50,000. Puerto Rico is poor. And yet, when the American Congress passes a law, for example, minimum wage, what do they use? Mainland standards. Even in Mississippi, the minimum wage bites a bit. In Puerto Rico, it has bitten, bitten a lot and has bit for a long time. There's a labor economist who, in general, is fairly sympathetic uh, to minimum wages and things like that that some of the rest of us are skeptical of. His name is Richard Freeman. He's at Harvard. And, but he did an article on Puerto Rico in 1989 or 1990 or thereabouts estimating that already the employment costs of the minimum wage as it then applied were about 10% loss in employment that early on. Now it is almost certainly greater. But again, the Puerto Ricans shoot themselves in the foot after the U.S. has done it the other one because they put in this Christmas bonus, which is another 8.5% above the minimum wage. Above. So it's above the U.S. minimum wage. They also put in a law saying that you've got to have cons you have to work a consecutive shift. You can't do split shifts, which for the tourist industry is devastating. You cannot hire anybody and may have them work more than 20, eight hours in any 24-hour period, which means that you can't work evenings one day in a restaurant and mornings the next. You can't even shift alone without a day off in between. Many of these regulations, well, you mentioned hiring, which is imp very important. Firing is impossible, too. So once you've taken on a worker, you've got to give him a big, big payout. Many of these things have hurt, and that's why employment is so low. And without changing that, there's not much hope of anything. And they are afraid to change it because they're afraid that wages will go down. The fact is there are ways of doing it. For example, putting in apprenticeship programs. You could put in a two or three year period where new, new young people under the age of, say, 25 could work for two or three years. It, uh, and perhaps a subsidized wage or perhaps a wage much lower, something, but you'd have to have a provision that they stay on. I could continue, but I don't have time, and I know I'm going to get caught quickly, so I'm going to go on. <laughs> I won't speak much about debt, because I know uh, that Desmond will do that. 
But let me first, and most importantly, the things that need to be done, and what I worry about, even in what I heard with the control board now, and they're obviously doing a good job, they understand the need for growth, I'm not sure they're doing enough, but I haven't heard and seen the details, so I won't argue on that. But it isn't enough to decide that let, have the Congress pass a law. It has to be implemented. And my guess is, as has happened in the past, there could be orders going out and things don't happen. Year after year, when it became clear there was going to be a budget deficit, the governor sent out an order to all the agencies saying, cut your expenditures for the rest of the year by 5%, 7% or whatever. And all the agencies kept on spending and put the chits in the dust drawer. And at the end of the year, when the next fiscal year started, they pulled them out and paid them. By the time we were looking at things, which is now two years ago, we were guessing that arrears were, if I remember correctly, on the order of four and a half billion dollars. That's a huge amount in Puerto Rico, where GDP is about 70 to 72 billion dollars, something like that. The second, so the first thing I would say is, Measures have to be put in place for implementation and strong implementation because it isn't going to happen automatically. They're too used to putting the chits in the desk drawer. They're too used to ignoring what comes out because they've been doing it right along. Secondly, statistics are bad. It was mentioned that we don't have the certified accounts beyond fiscal 14, which ended, by the way, in June 30th, 2014. So it's now almost three years out of date. We're getting the next one, I think, quite shortly, which two years, that's unheard of, even in some of the countries where they're do, doing business rating is well below what it is in Puerto Rico. The numbers are bad and they're unreliable. As I said, we don't know the informal sector, we don't know anything. And two things I would hope the control board will have paid a lot of attention to, aside from these other things, which would, I think, have an immediate effect, would be implementation. And if implementation doesn't happen, if they take people off the payroll only when they retire, or they put them on as consultants, or they do other imaginative things, and we all know how those things work, it's not going to show up until there's a deficit at the end of the year, and then they'll cut back across the board, and there'll be screams because something really important uh, didn't happen, and so on and so forth. Uh, growth is essential. They're going to have to do more if to get growth on the wage side. In my view, if they keep up with the negative growth, 1% to 2% a year, which is in the range it is now, even with loss of population, that's going to just be five years is not sustainable with that. They need to move faster and to get some kind of shock in the system that can get things going. I do think that some kind of wage subsidy for young people or some kind of apprenticeship program is one thing that could help. I know the Puerto Ricans are resisting, but I do not understand why. <coughs> because the young people, when they can't find jobs, either go into the informal sector or go out on, on welfare or they leave. This is not what you should want for your young people in the years when they need training. And yet, if you can't train your workers when they come in, how do you get factory workers if you go in with something other than a pharmaceutical or something for skilled? So I, in my view, it's important. Getting rid of, as quickly as possible of the ad hoc negotiation, firm by firm, for who's going to come in and who's going to get how much of a tax break and who's going to get what kind of subsidy is clearly, again, important. One of the worst aspects of economic policy in many of the countries that are ranked with or below Puerto Rico has been the ad hoc company by company subsidy or uh, tax relief or whatever you wish to call it. Uh, in Puerto Rico's case, they're up with the best of them in that, or the worst, I think would be a better word. They know how to do it, they've done it, and it has created havoc in a number of dimensions. And no businessman in his right mind today would go to Puerto Rico and say, look, I want to invest, even if he did, a uh, 10 however billion dollars, million dollars, whatever, and not wait to see how much of a tax break he could get. And he would have a fair idea by just looking at what the taxes were, what the tax average break has been. And why would he go there if he doesn't get such a break unless the control board does something very strong to make sure that these kind of ad hoc things don't happen anymore. <laughs> You might even want to consider something like buying out some of these contracts that have the low taxes uh, with something, but with a commitment that is enforceable that the company that is now getting the buyout has to stay there. Uh, this is a problem with all of these things. They made a promise for 10 or 15 and sometimes 20 years. And they say, well, we can't change that. Well, if they can't change that, they've got the ad hoc discriminatory system. If they've got that, they're not going to get anywhere. And so something has to be done, but breaking it is going to be difficult without some intervention. And I think that's where the control board, again, can play an important role. I could go on, but I'm sure I just knew what I was going to say. I'm going to sure he's <laughs> tap that glass. I, <laughs> take it away from him. <laughs> In any event, Puerto Rico deserves to get turned around. They are in hard times. There's no doubt about it. 
the, the loss of the Affordable Care Act, which was already mentioned, is terrible. It was a $4 billion, a small island. There, if, I think we calculated, my memory may be wrong, but if they were in Mississippi, the amount they would be getting is more than it now is by quite a bit, and they would be being cut off in any event. There are things where they're subject to the US law, which made for rich countries, they're a poor country, and they're supposed to finance it when even the poor and the rich country aren't. I don't understand. Somehow we have to treat the island better, but they have to treat themselves better. And it ought to be possible, I think, for the control board to point out some of these anomalies to the American Congress and perhaps even cut a deal in which, yes, the Puerto Ricans will indeed finally start in implementing their own regulations, but in return, some of the things that the U.S. is doing make it easier for the U.S. Uh, for them to start growth again, which they could, should do, and I think could have a very good future. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> Antonio. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thank you, Desmond, for organizing the conference. Thank you to AEI. Uh, I would also like to recognize Jose Carrion and Andrew Biggs for their very professional and serious-minded approach to uh, these problems. Uh, I think, uh, unlike Anne, I would say there are areas where I disagree with some of the remarks uh, that have been made, but um, uh, we can leave that for the discussion. And I would like to rather focus on the here and now of the crisis. And so I will speak a bit about the debt, uh, about the stay, and about the path forward. Uh, so this is a week of great consequence for the people of Puerto Rico. On Monday, May Day, there were thousands of workers and students gathered in San Juan in a national protest against the debt crisis and against the austerity measures that have been described and which they face. And at midnight on Monday, the automatic stay on litigation provided by PROMESA against Puerto Rico expired which allowed more than a dozen lawsuits to proceed, uh, including one in the Southern District uh, of New York, which I'd like to quote from, and it says quite simply that geodebt is constitutionally required to be paid first in terms of scarcity, ahead of even what the government deems essential services. And yesterday, six new lawsuits were filed. Now, no one can predict the precise timing nature or consequences of additional litigation. But one thing is certain, more will follow, with uncertainty as to whether the island can provide services to its people. Now, since the bill was enacted, more than $2 billion in debt payments have been suspended. So ask yourself what a resumption of payments would mean for the citizens of Puerto Rico. So let me say a word about legislative intent. And uh, Congress worked with the administration, and I'm joined by my former colleague, Kent Heitschu of Treasury, uh, who was side by side with me in this, but for more than a year uh, to negotiate PROMESA. And it reflects all of the imperfections of compromise. Uh, neither side got everything that it wanted. And so as a result, it was not an easy vote for any member of Congress. And yet it received the support of two thirds of the Hispanic caucus and bipartisan majorities in both chambers. Why? Because it affords powerful tools to help arrest the debt crisis. It is now time to use those tools. One of those is the ability to stay litigation that threatens the provision of essential services. And the legislative intent clearly documented in the drafts of the, of the bill was for there never to be a break in that stay. And now, as of midnight on Monday, we face exactly such a break. And there can be no justification to allow this period, which is fraught with danger, to continue. It is imperative that the governor and the board enact Title III restructuring before a court of law, which provides for an additional stay. All of the prerequisites of Title III have been met. First, there is a total impasse with creditors. Second, the board, as has been described, 
has certified timely a fiscal plan. And third, all parties agree that Puerto Rico needs to adjust its debts. To ensure the safety and well-being of the people of Puerto Rico today, it is time for Title III proceedings. So I'll add uh, a word about the economy. So GDP, as everyone here knows, has contracted by 14% in the past decade. The number of employed people on the island has decreased by about 25% over that period. And as Jose Carrion uh, pointed out, fully 46% of re residents and 64% of children five and under live below the poverty line. So it should be no surprise that young families continue to leave the island in search of greater opportunity on the mainland, and they leave behind an aging population and a hived out long-term revenue base. In the past decade alone, more than 450,000 Puerto Ricans have left, exceeding the great exodus in the post-war period. And under current law, the economy faces an unprecedented funding cliff. The, the pensions have been discussed. There are $50 billion in public pensions which are virtually unfunded. And this is a crisis without parallel anywhere in the United States. Not even the $1.5 billion and counting, as Anne mentioned, of defined contributions remain. They have been used for other purposes. And for many retirees, the pensions are the sole means of survival and the average mo monthly benefit is around $1,000. Now consider health care. Congress is providing $295 million in Medicaid funding as we speak, and yet this is just a stopgap measure. The people require full parity with the states, and in the meantime, the government must fund health care out of revenues, which is at a cost of more than $2 billion annually. So, so what's the result of these cliffs? Without further action, the primary deficit in fiscal 2018, namely the budget shortfall before debt service, would be $1.5 billion. And this would increase to $5 billion by 2026. So the fiscal plan proposed by the governor and certified by the board addresses these shortfalls, and it does so based on current federal law as required by the act. Now much has already been asked of the people of Puerto Rico. There have been reforms and the plan requires uh, further. It requires dramatic downsizing of government, radical reductions in health care benefits, and further pension and structural reforms. And in return, the level of debt service is reduced by around 75% to $800 million annually. And yet, this is arguably more than the economy can support. The fiscal plan projects real growth will decline 2% in 2017 and 4% in 2018. Longer term, Puerto Rico is not expected to return to positive nominal growth until at least 2014. 2024. I'm oh, sorry, 24. Uh, the goal must be to restore growth and to reverse the tide of out-migration, to make Puerto Rico a place that offers stability and opportunity for young families. So the question must be, what is the path forward? First, a Title III restructuring is required post-haste. The past two years of voluntary negotiations under two administrations has shown the impossibility of resolving conflicting interests in a weakening economy out of court. There will be a need for fiscal adjustment and all parties will continue to sacrifice. There is also a pressing need for greater fiscal transparency and accountability, which Governor Rosseo has begun to address. But there is also a need for hope. In my judgment, the debt should be adjusted to a level that allows the economy not just to stabilize, but to grow. 80% of the debt is held off-island, and the effect on the local economy of debt reduction is far less punitive 
than the effect of a reduced pension or a lost job. Restructuring, however, is just one component of the solution. Without new funding, Puerto Rico's Medicaid system and the 2.4 million American citizens that rely on it could collapse. So given the uncertainty over access <coughs> to those funds, the certified fiscal plan forecasts $2.5 billion in cost reductions over 10 years to healthcare. So to achieve those savings, the government plans to reduce Medicaid reimbursement rates and to virtually eliminate all non-core services, including dental care and optometry from benefit packages. These cuts will become a reality unless Congress provides additional funding. Critically, any incremental funding should be used to restore cuts imposed by the fiscal plan and not to increase creditor recoveries. Debt restructuring should precede, should precede long-term health care funding to prevent such an outcome. In addition, Congress should implement an EITC for Puerto Rico. An EITC is among the most proven bipartisan tools for stimulating economic growth and rewarding work. The EITC, in our judgment, should be federally sponsored and locally administered, and it addresses many of the issues of workforce participation and the informal labor market, which um, the other panelists have, have mentioned. So in conclusion, PROMESA affords powerful tools to restructure the debt and to restore confidence in Puerto Rico's financial management. Those tools should be forcefully deployed today. But there will be more for Congress to do. Over time, Medicaid parity must be granted as a basic right, and an EITC would prove a powerful stimulus for growth. The stakes could not be higher or more tangible or more immediate because the safety and well-being of 3.5 million fellow citizens in Puerto Rico are in the balance. Thank you. Thanks, Antonio. Desmond. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, I thought at, that at this stage, you know, having heard different presentations on Puerto Rico, uh, that I'd look at the situation through, in a different way through the prism of uh, the Eurozone debt crisis. Uh, and I do that because I think that there are very many lessons that can be learned for Puerto Rico from that crisis. There are very many parallels, as I'll explain. And it seems to me you know, that I'm agreeing with much of what Antonio says. It looks like Puerto Rico's making many of the same mistakes that some of the countries in the Eurozone debt crisis uh, made. So basically what I want to do is really structure my remarks, uh, first looking at the parallels between Puerto Rico and the Eurozone area. Secondly, looking at the lessons that one might have learned from uh, the Eurozone debt crisis and then see at what is going on in Puerto Rico, why they're not really drawing those lessons. And that really does give for a rather grim outlook unless, uh, as Antonio might say, PROMESA is forcefully imposed. Congress provides additional support to the island. Uh, we should really brace ourselves for this island continuing to go into decline. So let me just start uh, by just saying the uh, parallels between Puerto Rico and the Eurozone debt crisis are pretty close. Uh, both of them are stuck in monetary unions. The Europeans stuck with the euro. The Puerto Ricans stuck with the US dollar. What that means is they don't have their own interest rate policy. They don't have their own exchange rate policy. So they don't have something with which to offset a lot of fiscal uh, tightening. Uh, the second is, you know, as we've heard uh, much about it, is Puerto Rico's got really very compromised uh, public finances, <coughs> much as much of the European countries had uh, very high 
levels of budget deficits, high levels of debt, unfunded pensions. We've heard Puerto Rico's now at something like 100% of GNP in terms of their public debt ratio, something like 50% of GDP in terms of unfunded pension liabilities. So it's very compromised. Uh, the situation, though, in Puerto Rico is worse than that in Europe in a number of ways. Uh, you know, the first is that, uh, as this chart shows, Puerto Rico is now starting its adjustment process, not from a position where the economy is doing rather well, but rather it's starting its position after 10 years of being in a slump where we've heard GDP's declined by something like uh, 10%, uh, <laughs> that the population has gone down by 10% at a time that the United States population has increased by 10%. So it's really in a really very difficult uh, situation. Another thing that makes Puerto Rico's situation more difficult than that of Europe's is that the European adjustment process was occurring at a time that the euro was weakening, that interest rates were being reduced, <coughs> that oil prices were declining. Puerto Rico is now going to have to do this fiscal adjustment with exactly the reverse, where it looks like United States interest rates are going to be rising, the dollar is going to be strengthening, oil prices are going to be going up. It's also getting hit by a Zika shock, you know, so there's another supply shock, which uh, is uh, the last thing uh, that uh, uh, Puerto Rico needs. And then there's the issue of uh, a debt situation that is so much more complex than Europe's that there's something like 18 different debt issues. Everybody's got different streams, uh, got claims to different streams. So to think that this is going to get solved in a voluntary, friendly kind of way, I think is engaging uh, in uh, delusional thinking. You know, there's absolutely no way in my mind that you're going to get a voluntary debt restructuring an economy that's very weak with this kind of complex uh, debt situation. So let me turn now to the lessons uh, from the euro crisis you know, that might be relevant for Puerto Rico. Uh, the first of these is, you know, as the IMF learned the hard way, that the fiscal multipliers in a monetary union can be pretty high. You know, the IMF initially thought that there'd be something like 0.5. Uh, they then acknowledged that it could be anywhere between 0 0.9 and 1.7. What this means is say that the debt ratio is something like 1.5, it means for every 1% of fiscal tightening that you're doing, the economy by the fiscal tightening, if we just looked at the fiscal tightening alone, is going to push the economy down by one and a half points. I mean, that's huge. An economy that's declining by uh, uh, something like 1% a year on a secular basis, and now you're going to be doing fiscal adjustment by two, three, four percentage points a year, you're talking about a major hit uh, to the economy. Uh, the second point uh, where uh, a lesson can be learned is that what found in the European countries is that those that did the fiscal adjustment with structural reform that made the labor markets more uh, flexible, that improved way of doing business that made it more attractive for investment, countries like Ireland and countries like Spain had less of an adjustment than countries like Greece or countries like Italy that didn't do it. So the key lesson that I draw from this is that just <coughs> focusing on fiscal adjustment as the Puerto Ricans seem to be doing right now without accompanying it by real structural reform that are going to change the economy is really a recipe for the economy going into a, uh, a big slump. Uh, the other point that uh, a lesson from the Eurozone crisis was that delaying debt restructuring is a big mistake. You know, that what it does is it creates uncertainty. It doesn't, it requires more fiscal adjustment than is needed. So if you need to do the debt restructuring, if you can't pay the debts, delaying that uh, really is not uh, a solution. And the other thing uh, that uh, this chart really suggests is that Greece, which had the largest sovereign debt restructuring on record, uh, if you don't go far enough and you don't have growth, what you're going to do is you're going to revisit the debt restructuring another time. So you know, Greece is just on its way 
to uh, debt being something like 250, 300% of GDP again, so it's going to have to have another restructuring. So one better get the debt restructuring right the first time and accompany it by proper measures. Well, this leaves me to uh, where I see Puerto Rico repeating the mistakes of uh, the Eurozone. They're doing fiscal adjustment in the middle of a, uh, uh, a big slump. They're not accompanying this with much in the way of uh, structural reform, and they're delaying the dealing uh, with the debt situation. So, in short, this makes me uh, really very pessimistic as to what the outlook for the country is. It looks to me like this country is just going to continue in a downward uh, economic and social spiral. Politically, it's not going to be uh, sustainable in the end. You're going to get population uh, moving uh, to uh, the mainland, and you're going to have deep debt restructuring, and possibly you'll do it on a, a multiple basis. I'll just conclude by saying that uh, this isn't only my view. Uh, this seems to be the view of people who wrote the fiscal plan. Uh, I just put this chart up, uh, you know, which really, to me, looks rather alarming. The uh, uh, blue line is that of Greece, which has been the worst uh, performing economy since the United States Great Depression. Uh, but Puerto Rico looks like it's going to be <coughs> outdoing it. That the dotted lines are where the fiscal plan is, so that after the economy having already slumped by 15% or so over the last 10 years, uh, we've got another 10, 15% slump ahead of us. Uh, this to me looks like it's uh, really uh, on the road to uh, a real uh, a humanitarian crisis. You, you're going to get people uh, going to the mainland. Uh, the other thing I'd just point out, uh, you know, which has been mentioned before, is even with all of the fiscal adjustment, uh, this chart uh, would indicate uh, how little money there's going to be left for debt repayment. So if you can only really pay something like 25% of your debt service uh, payments, uh, you know, not to be restructuring the debt right now uh, doesn't, to me, make a lot of sense. Uh, Alex. Thank you. And thank Thanks uh, to Jose and to the panel for a series of really interesting and uh, insightful presentations. I'd, I'd like to give each member of the panel a chance to react to what anybody else has said, add some thoughts. Uh, and you probably have more thoughts you'd like mm -hmm. you, you to add. Let me add. start. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to start with you, but oh. I, I know you have a lot. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding about your, uh, your references to my, my famous class. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's give each, each member of the panel two minutes, maximum three, just to add anything you want. We'll just go down the line. Andrew, starting with you. Um, th there's very little I, d I, dis I disagree with, with with any of the speakers. It, on, on policy, I, I think, Antonio, you made points on EITC and, and Medicaid. And th these may be kind of minor distinctions. But when I think about add layering an EITC, an earned income tax credit, which is a wage subsidy, on top of the existing welfare programs in Puerto Rico, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what that's going to do in the sense of if you have a 100% implicit tax rate for, for low income people who are working now in the ITC, maybe that'll lower to 80% or something like that. Still, it's, I, I, I think if we're, if we're going to look at reforms to, to, to the welfare and transfer, programs in, in Puerto Rico, I think we really need to, to look very carefully at it, get some labor economists and say, okay, it's like, okay, as a package, what are the incentives we're presenting to people? I really think there's a temptation in Congress to say, okay, well, these guys need EITC, let's just pass it. And I think we really need to think very carefully about that. The, the Medicaid issue, I, again, I don't, I'm not against you know, some additional Medicaid money for the island. But there, I guess there, there's two points I would make. One is that, you know, yes, Puerto Rico gets a lower match rate than, say, Mississippi does. And if Puerto Rico were a state, it would get much greater Medicaid money than it, than it does now. But, you know, people need to bear in mind that, you know, Mississippi may be a poor state, but Mississippi pays income taxes. 
If, and they, they pay income taxes, which are used to fund Medicaid. And I just think that's, that is something that, that should be borne in mind, that, that states are paying for this and they're getting money back. Uh, Puerto Ricans don't pay federal income taxes. So it's, you know, and, and there's a reason why there was originally a lower match rate. And I think we just need to be, be cognizant of that. But the, a second point on, on Medicaid funding is, is the question of, you know, what are we trying to do with this? If you look at the, the experiment that the state of Oregon did with Medicaid, they only had money to expand it to a certain number of people in the state. Some pe additional people got Medicaid, <coughs> others didn't. And so they could go back later, and there's been academic studies of this, and say, okay, what was the impact on people's health as a result of getting Medicaid? And the answer was pretty much nothing. That it, it had a very, very small Im health impact on people. It had a financial impact. It made their financial lives better, which do doesn't mean you shouldn't do the additional Medicaid funding, but it, but it does imply if we are putting money in there for financial reasons, then we want to think in terms of what is, what is the best avenue to do it. Is the, is the best way to do it via Medicaid or by other means? It might be via Medicaid in the sense of maintaining kind of the healthcare infrastructure on the island because so much of healthcare comes through the government. They have a problem with doctors leaving and all that. But as with the EITC, I think that the, the key is, is, is don't just say, hey, Congress needs to act now and do these things. It's to really step back and say, okay, what is it we're trying to accomplish? If we do this policy, what is going to be the result for people? Um, and, and so it's just, it's, you know, it's a time, I mean, obviously time is short, but I don't think it's so short that we, need, we don't have time to really try to, to, to dig through these issues a little bit. Okay, thanks. Anne? Well, uh, I think I agree with most things, but unfortunately I've had a little bit of a disagreement here. I think EITC could be important. You, in fact, mentioned the labor force issues that I mentioned, the low labor force participation, and of course they're related. There's also an informal sector. And that informal sector uh, is informal because they're avoiding what there is, and the EITC would presumably bring some of that back reasonably soon, especially among young, and you put, combine that with something like more incentive for young people to stay on the island and get lower paying jobs at first, but for two, three years or whatever, and apprenticeships. Uh, you could do quite a bit with the two things. And EI, the second comment would be that I understand the Puerto Ricans on taxes, but I don't know anything in EITC that says that states that pay lower income taxes or state lower taxes to the federal government have to have a different formula for distribution uh, than the states with lower per capita income. The formula for giving aid is the same across the states. It isn't a function of how much taxes they pay into the federal government. My, my point, though, is something like Medicare is funded by a payroll tax that workers pay. They're paying money to the system. They're getting money back. Okay, I'm going to try and use my okay. time anyway. Okay, but, but, uh, but Medicaid <laughs> isn't. <laughs> but we, we Anne just, is getting her own time. Sorry. We disagree on that. Uh, as I said, I think that could be a good one. Uh, I think it is one that would be quick and would be relatively costless uh, as th these things go, at least for the federal government to do, that would have a bigger benefit than some others that would not. I would, however, once again stress that I would try somehow, and I don't know how, to tie these together, that the things the federal government could do should somehow be at least partly a function of the control board being willing to say that yes, they are implementing what they have said they would do when they after they pass the legislation, because the control board is not strong as yet on implementation. Uh, uh, you know, no stick uh, with it. They could say you can't pass the law, but once the law is passed or <laughs> regulation, what do they then do? And that's where I worry that we have a big problem. So I would stress it again. But certainly EITC, certainly the better formula for ACA on the U.S. side. But in return, Puerto Rico should be doing some things too. It isn't one side or the other. And I do, I would, I agree on the debt uh, completely with Antonio, except for one thing. Somehow that too, it seems to me, ought to be tied in ways in which they will convince us that they'll do the reforms. Maybe it could be one, you know, partially at a time or something, but it cannot be that they get the debt relief now and then they will, will depend on them to do the other things later with, with no tool for implementation enforcement. That would be my, my comment there. Thank you. Uh, Antonio, two or three minutes. Well, ag again, uh, I'm not under advice of legal counsel, <coughs> so I, I will say, number one, uh, the stay needs to be continued, uh, that essential services are threatened, that out-of-court uh, consensual discussions with bondholders have failed, and it is time or past time for a Title III vote. Uh, second, 
uh, I applaud uh, the notion of a once and done approach, and that is exactly what would allow for greater optimism uh, than Desmond has articulated, which is to say, unlike some of the Eurozone cases, uh, there would be a sufficient debt relief day one such that there could be hope. Uh, following uh, the debt relief, there does need to be something done on Medicaid. Our judgment has been it should be parity with the states, and there need to be additional tools to stimulate growth. But again, uh, the, the pathway in, in my judgment should be number one, continue the stay. This allows essential services to keep flowing. Number two, uh, enact Title III. Once the debt is restructured, address these long-standing inequities in healthcare funding and provide tools for additional growth. Um, as to implementation and Anne's point, the board does not go away. Uh, the board will go away uh, following uh, four years of balanced budgets and a return to traditional municipal bond markets. And so the bill was in fact designed with the idea that uh, the fiscal plan would be adhered to in budgets, that budgets would conform with actual performance, and that there be remedies in the event that that doesn't take place. Um, so uh, I, I agree that the situation is, is dire, uh, and we are talking about our fellow citizens, uh, but I do believe that a once and done approach, an aggressive use of the tools provided by PROMESA, can provide the beginning of a path forward. Thanks. Desmond, further comments? Yeah. I'd agree with Antonio that that could be the beginning of the path forward, but it strikes me that what is lacking here is a real plan as to how we're going to solve this country's financial problems, how we're going to put this country on a faster economic growth path, and we just seem to be thinking about partial kind of solutions. So we've got a fiscal plan, but it's not really related to anything else, you know, that really what this strikes me as would be an ideal kind of case for the IMF to come in here, you know, granted this is part of the United States, but to actually fashion some sort of program where the creditors take a hit, but the country is forced to follow policies, things are made conditional on the country actually uh, delivering the stuff, and in return, one could be providing additional uh, financing. But so long as we go about this in a very partial way, I don't see how you get the country onto a uh, growth path, and if you don't get it onto a growth path, uh, there's very little prospect that they're going to be able to remotely uh, meet their debt commitments. Thank you. Well, as uh, we've uh, been here, they uh, must have been listening to you, Antonio, because I have a, uh, a new uh, posting from the New York Times here. The governor of Puerto Rico said he would move the island's debt crisis into the equivalent of federal bankruptcy court, making it the largest government to seek refuge from its creditors in history. Uh, will not formally be called bankruptcy, as we know, but it is the court procedure called for in the PROMESA Act, so that the governor has now requested that as we've been here. And, and as I uh, said when I was introducing Desmond, it just shows how excellent Desmond's and my timing was on <laughs> setting up this conference. Um, we're going to uh, come to your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I know you have a lot of them. Uh, may I remind you, please uh, wait for the microphone. Uh, when you get the microphone, uh, uh, tell us who you are and what your affiliation is, and then ask your question. Uh, we will have a lot of questions, and, and uh, we ask that if you preface your question by a uh, statement, that that statement be uh, not more than 30 seconds. And if it is, the uh, chair will remind you. I'm going to move from right to left here. We'll start with this gentleman right here. Hi, my name is Federico Jesus. Um, I agree with Desmond and Antonio that Puerto Rico needs uh, 
tools for economic development, and I wanted to see if the panel could comment on the effects of federal tax reform on Puerto Rico, given that uh, Puerto Rico is a foreign tax jurisdiction, but they're American citizen workers. And then any switch um, from the current system could affect the economic development of Puerto Rico, similar to what 936 caused. And I wanted to ask um, Andrew, um, you know, I agree that, that the impression in Puerto Rico might be a bit um, more than it is in terms of how people perceive the cuts, um, but sometimes it's hard for Puerto Ricans to swallow all of those cuts when they see the lavish expenditures by the board, including the $625,000 <laughs> salary of uh, Natalie Jaresko, plus all those trips back to Ukraine. Um, she earns more than the president of the World Bank, the IMF, the president of the United States, and uh, Janet Yellen at the Federal Reserve, so I wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Let's take the first uh, question uh, uh, well, first. Well, you take the second one, fine. O Jose, please, yes. Oh, so it was my decision, so I'll <laughs> Yeah, so I, um, uh, the, the choice of uh, Juresco was undertaken after an extensive uh, search uh, by an executive search firm that we hired, Hydric and Struggles. And um, to be frank, uh, that's what the market would bear with regards to specific things that we were looking for. And um, to, this goes directly to address uh, Dr. Kruger's point, that we thought that um, the issues going forward were going to be material with regards to implementing the issues that we had uh, negotiated uh, with the government with regards to the fiscal plan. And we feel that Natalie has, as a former Minister of Finance for Ukraine, uh, experienced um, essentially a similar situation to Puerto Rico is confronting uh, since the um, Russian invasion that would uh, suffice and provide her with the uh, characteristics that we need for her to do what needs to be done in Puerto Rico. And that's what the market would bear. And so we made the decision to move forward with that uh, hire. Thank you. Uh, any comments on tax reform and how that might affect Puerto Rico? This, if you could give it to uh, Ryan here. Thank you, Jose. My, I, I'm not a tax person nor a political person, so but my gut is that fundamental tax reform is not imminent, so it's just not something. Um, I know there have been some analyses of it. I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not strong enough on it to really tell you. It's just, I, my gut tells me it is not imminent, so other things may come first. Thank you. In the back here, it's, uh, yes, you, Bert. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, Bert Ely, a banking consultant. I apologize for. Uh, uh, being late to the program, but uh, my question for the panel, maybe specifically for Desmond, is: Is enough being done to uh, bring real private sector economic reform to uh, Puerto Rico, such as uh, uh, dealing with uh, inefficiencies due to uh, the labor laws, uh, uh, bringing down energy costs, possibly through a, a privatization of Prepa and, and otherwise, and trying to seek an exemption? from the U.S. minimum wage law for Puerto Rican uh, workers. To put another way, is enough being done to help the real economy of Puerto Rico recover? Thanks, Bert. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. You know, but I guess the way I would frame the question is how much reform do you really need to get the economy going? And I would look at it in relation to the amount of fiscal adjustment that is being required of that economy. So when I see that there's something like six points of GDP, a six points of GDP in fiscal adjustment that's been required over the next four years, that would tell me that that is going to involve a hit to the economy of something like 9%. So we need not Mickey Mouse kind of reform. You need fundamental economic reform. You probably need support from the US Congress if you're going to offset that uh, kind of hit. Otherwise, what you're going to have is you're going to have that economy you know, continuing on its declining path with people uh, leaving the island. So what I'm saying is you need major economic reform that covers quite a variety of uh, issues, labor market reform right up there. And I'm not sure that I see it. You know, when I read these reports, I'm not sure that I see uh, much commitment in the way to reform. It's something that you know you keep talking about. You know, maybe you'll do it sometime future, but in the meantime, you're subjecting that economy to a huge fiscal shock. Anne. Yeah. Uh, just to point out, 
that a lot of the reform that is needed for the private sector does not show up in the fiscal accounts. And what worries me about the emphasis on fiscal, which is what the control board is first of all charged with, is precisely that things like so many of the labor market reforms and so on will not show up there. And therefore, that's why I said I thought implementation and how to get control over some of that is important. Because there's nothing you can do directly uh, with fiscal say they, they, if they have the balanced budget, the fact they didn't change the labor law, the fact they didn't do this, that, or the other, is all part of what can go wrong and what worries me greatly. On energy, just a point, and that is that a lot of the excess cost of energy in Puerto Rico, well, first part of it is because they use oil, which all Caribbean islands do, but the second part is because they, again, the U.S. shot them in the foot because of the Jones Act. So their oil is 40% more expensive, last number I saw, than, Puerto Rico, than the Dominican Republic oil. Thank you. I think I had a question right here. Yeah. Then I'm going to come to you. My, my name is Alberto Perez. I'm a financial consultant. Um, there is, and this is a great panel. Thank you very much. Um, there's a major exogenous factor that kind of is in the air, and but nobody mentioned, which is in June, Puerto Ricans are going to be asked to opine about where they want to be in, the, in their future status with the U.S. And that could mean major changes to the whole economic and, and, and fiscal uh, uh, um, situation in Puerto Rico. And I was wondering if you could potentially, if you thought of it, or if you could address it in terms of what you think, broad brush, I, it's a, you know, the impact would be of any uh, change of status either way. Okay, thanks. Comments on yeah, the I, Puerto Rican? I think, of course we thought of it. Uh, on statehood, it's not going to be an option until the U.S. Congress approves it. That's not going to happen until there's a pairing with some state or other potential entrant as a state who would be vote Republican because that's the way the Senate and the House think. And so, for, you know, you pair them in order to get it. And right now, there's no pair that I can see in prospect. So I don't think much of that one. If Puerto Rico chooses independence, I think the losses, well, first off, I can't quite picture that because the losses would be so great in terms of U.S. assistance that, that now is coming in. Uh, the, we talk about a fiscal shock this way, whew, 12 billion at <laughs> once. Uh, somehow or other, that doesn't seem uh, as if it would be that <laughs> too wise either. So I have not spent a lot of time worrying about what, what they should do, because what they should do with independence would be, or, uh, would be much the same as what they need to do now. And uh, so there's that. One problem is that the independence party, because it wants independence, keeps on insisting that there should be no restructuring of debt. They want to keep the minimum wage. They want to keep everything at mainland levels. But the, the, the thought ought to be we'll, we'll get to per capita income rising to a point where mainland levels will be more reasonable, and there should be some adjustment period, in my view. For the comments, I'll make one comment on this one, which is an advantage of independence would be, to follow Desmond's point, that you would break out of being locked into the dollar zone. Uh, and as we know, locked into a bigger currency zone, it means all the adjustment falls internally on, on internal adjustment instead of an external currency adjustment. Uh, and Puerto Rico, in my judgment, needs very much a depreciation of its currency. Now, whether, whether you could have an independent Puerto Rican currency while remaining in its commonwealth status, which could be, which could be uh, depreciated against the dollar, I think is an interesting theoretical question we ought to think about. I promise this is the next question right here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gretchen Sierra Zarita. Thanks for today. Um, my question is as follows. Um, as you know, there's a lot of frustration in Puerto Rico um, because people feel they have been handed a bill and they do not know what's in this bill. It's the debt. And this is why so many people want to have a multi-sectoral audit of the debt, uh, and why the demonstrations took, for a, a, to a large extent, on Monday, although that was not the entire reason. Now, here's my question. I understand what a multi-sectoral or, or an audit of the entire debt would do. Um, oh, by the way, I should mention that neither the previous administration or the current administration are interested in this audit, OK? But I understand what it would accomplish in terms of transparency, in terms of renewed trust in the government, in terms of justice should faults be found. But what I'd like you guys to explain is an audit of the debt, a global audit of the debt, what it would accomplish in terms of the bankruptcy uh, process. Would it help us understand the debt better, to restructure it better, to reduce it, to find illegalities? Can you speak to that? And who would be best equipped to do this holistic audit of the debt? Should it still be a multi-sectoral group of people, 
made up of Puerto Ricans, or should we bring in outsider independent contractors, or just uh, explain this to me. Thank okay, you. Good questions uh, on uh, 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 comments Gretchen, on order of the debt. Yeah. Yeah. I, so just to touch on that, um, among the 14 provisions of the fiscal plan, two, two, two points that address this that, ex that are in PROMESA. Number, number one, uh, it says that the plan should respect lawful liens and lawful debts. And those two insertions of the word lawful were very deliberate. And second, uh, uh, it, it also provides that the oversight board should consider the results of the commission to audit the debt. So now with today's filing, or I guess it's not a filing, it's a request for a filing, but uh, others here know exactly where that stands, <laughs> there, there, there would be a judge. And that judge uh, would be tasked with adjudicating uh, claims as to lawfulness of liens and lawfulness of debt. And the board would be tasked with uh, opining as to whether uh, that lawfulness uh, is being adhered to. So we now, for the first time, assuming this does proceed to Title III, have a single forum and a statute that provides for a path forward. Thank you. Daniel? Uh, thank you. I'm Daniel Hansen from Mason Capital. And uh, so in the fiscal plan, you use the fiscal multiplier 1.34, which Andy Wolf put forward. Um, and there are a range of folks who sort of would vary on what that number should be, right? Including folks associated with AEI, like Robert Barrow, folks associated with the White House, like Jason Furman. Um, but you know, a number of studies come in well below that, including an ECB review of the austerity programs, which put the range from 0.75 to 1.24. Um, rather than sort of bicker about what Sorry. that multiplier should be, I'm wondering if you can point to anything, any programs, any agencies within the Puerto Rican government that you think have a fiscal multiplier below 1.34. Maybe that's a question for you, Andrew. The, the answer is no, not in, in the sense of e I have independent judge of what the fiscal multipliers are. Um, I mean, I, you know, I've, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a pension guy, but you know, I know that you know the, the, you get a debate. You know, if you're thinking about say stimulus within the U.S. and you know, Congressional Budget Office comes out with their estimates of what fiscal multiplier be, and, they, and often they'll be a little well less than that. On the other hand, though, you know, you have the, the, you know, this question of how you characterize Puerto Rico. Um, you know, would you, would you think of it as a U.S. state? Would you think of it as an independent country? It's, it just becomes a much more difficult sort of thing. So, you know, we, this is not, you know, th those are not figures that I, you know, came up with. We, you know, we, we, we defer to our um, consultants in large part on that, but they don't, at, at the time, they don't seem unreasonable to me, I'll say that. But, you know, I would, I would acknowledge that, you know, honest people can differ on this because it's just difficult to characterize how to think about Puerto Rico in those contexts. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I had a question right here. Uh, good morning. My name is Antonio Diaz. I would like uh, to thank all of you for, uh, for being here today. Uh, I am currently one of the student, uh, people who left Puerto Rico. I'm part of the diaspora. I moved here a year ago. Uh, I've seen, uh, I've left my family behind, my friends behind. Uh, they're currently in the University of Puerto Rico. There is a proposal uh, of cutting over half a billion dollars uh, in education uh, that hasn't been spoken about that much. Uh, what do you guys, what is your message for people like me who are part of this uh, diaspora who's currently uh, working here for a better future, economic, political uh, stand? And what do you guys think regarding of El Paro Nacional or the March on Monday? And regarding a letter that was sent to both a senator from Arkansas <laughs> and from and Tom Tillis of uh, North Carolina regarding uh, the the bond creditors uh, negotiation. Thank you. I All right, take, comments. I can yeah. take part of that. Uh, we were we learned, and you don't probably know more about it than I do, uh, that a large number of the people going to the University of Puerto Rico uh, basically have gone to private high schools. They are not the poor in Puerto Rico. The University of Puerto Rico has very low tuition, even relative to its the country's per, the Commonwealth per I'm reading this one, uh, the country's the Commonwealth per capita income, uh, and and relative to public universities on the mainland, there is Puerto Rico could save on its fiscal side by cutting the or 
cutting the, re the subsidy to the University of Puerto Rico. The University of Puerto Rico could raise tuition, increase fellowship or scholarship aid for the students going there, and still come out with the same student population. I mean, it's, it's, why subsidize the wealthier kids who are going to the University of Puerto Rico? This is where, at the upper level, uh, the educational question is so big as to why is that. At the secondary and primary level, there's a big question because Puerto Rico has 30,000 or 40,000 more student, uh, more teachers than it did in 1970, and whichever is the other number, few, fewer students. There are fewer students and more teachers. Something is wrong. Uh, you don't need to, those kind. Of, 40,000 is a large number in in, in, a, in in an island of that size. I, I would just add, um, <clears throat> uh, we understand, or I understand, why there were protests on Monday, uh, and and someone. Uh, a candidate for this uh, oversight board asked me uh, in, in the process of vetting over the summer, you know, how, how would one measure success uh, of the uh, Puerto Rican project in the United States? And I think the, the best measure of success is that the out-migration would not only stop, but reverse itself, mm -hmm. which is why I said in my opening remarks that there needs to be a tangible sense of hope for the young people in Puerto Rico and for the young families so that uh, Puerto Ricans can make their future in Puerto Rico and are not forced by inadequate health care, forced by inadequate worker protections, forced by continuing sacrifice to move to the mainland. And so, you know, it is the case that the wave of out migration after World War II uh, was reversed. Uh, subsequently. And so it is possible that if uh, the various steps we've discussed are taken, uh, we could again see a reversal of that trend. Thank you. We have a question over here. Yep, yeah, uh, Pat Spann, just a federal retiree. Uh, this week I got my um, uh, Franklin Templeton uh, Virginia tax free bond fund thing. And I noticed that the, uh, the value of the 3.5% uh, was Puerto Rican bonds. And the value of the uh, bonds was a little over 50% of what the face value was. And listening to you guys talk today, I wonder if you could tell me, was that, is that an overly optimistic value? It sounds, <laughs> it sounds like, sounds like they're, they're, they're worthless. I mean, is, is, uh, the fact that they're valued at well, maybe about 55% of face value um, and I noticed this it has shrunk in the last couple of years from 5% of the total bond fund to 3.5%. To and, and I gather somebody told me that one of these things when you had it at the old location was the, uh, some, some state's fund, maybe it was Maryland, was like 80-some percent was uh, Puerto Rican bonds. It was just an unbelievable <laughs> amount of uh, these tax-free bond funds were Puerto Rican uh, bonds. And I, so my, that's my basic question is that 55% value, is that just overly optimistic? It sounds like from what you guys are saying, they're worthless. Okay, how about uh, 55 cents as a value? Well, I can give you the first part of the answer, which is that the complexity of the bond structure has already been mentioned. And it's a big problem because one of the things that will have to come through the court is whether all of these go together or whether they go into different piles. And if they go into the same pile, uh, it's a, quite a different story, even bond for bond, because it would be a question of how you took into it. The first part of any bankruptcy or restructuring of that kind of thing has to be to get a hold of the whole thing, value it, figure out what's legitimate or legal, what is not, and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I wouldn't like to guess at what the, quote, relevant number is because quite clearly the bondholders well I think get something back unless there's not enough now so the island continues to sink uh, but if indeed the control board is successful and there's growth uh, there will be something for bondholders in the future the value won't drop to zero but what it will be will depend on how the different issues of bonds are treated and how well the island recovers and what the legal process is and what the judges say. As so we haven't mentioned uh uh, but their bondholders have a dispute with each other about, oh, yeah. the, about the priority among, among the bonds. Uh, we're going to have one more question uh, right here, please. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, the panel, I'm sure, will be happy to stay afterward for those of you who want to talk informally. Yes. Thanks. Jeb Mason with the Cypress Group. Um, I think the case has been made pretty well today that Puerto Rico's in need not just a fiscal adjustment, but also debt restructuring under Title III. Um, the other element, of course, is the need for structural reform. 
And I think the board and the governor both said that the fiscal plan is going to be a living, breathing document that will continue to be adjusted over time. I wonder, just ask a more pointed question, does the board envision being able to include more structural form as part of its future fiscal plans and those changes and, and tying more explicitly, as some have suggested, um, Puerto Rico doing certain structural forms to this opportunity to restructure the debt under Title III? Whether the, okay, whether the board can, through permission, make, make contingent in that way, I, I don't know, so I don't give you an answer on that, but I know the board has, from, from the, from the get-go, we have been concerned about structural reform because, yeah, again, as, as, as Anna Desmond have said, you, you know, it's, this isn't just a fiscal problem. Um, and you know, as Anne pointed out, the implementation is a, is a real issue. If this were an independent country dealing with the IMF, you would have that contingency and then, then a follow-up so you can, you can make the, the structural reforms happen. Um, I think you know, within the limits of what the, the board has afforded, we definitely want to do that because we, we, we completely recognize that there are structural issues as well as just the, the, the core fiscal imbalance and those two things need, need to be addressed. Um, you know, ultimately you want, it's, you know, the, the board has a lot of power, but when you come to implementation, the powers are more limited, just on a, on a practical basis. So I think you want to use the, the, the incentives um, that you can present to the government so they will want to do these things. Because you can't, have, in, imposing structural reforms on a government that doesn't want to do them is, is extremely difficult. So you have to align incentives, and I think we'll be doing that as much as we can. Important note to end on. Let's thank our excellent keynote speaker and panel. Thank you for coming. Great job.